Our speaker today is Evan Roth. He's a multidisciplinary American artist based in Paris. He's working with sculptures, prints, videos, and websites. And in the upcoming hour during his talk, he will take you on a journey about art, politics, culture, the misuse of communication technologies, and how all of these are connected to each other. Please give a warm round of applause for Evan Roth, our speaker today. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody, thanks so much for coming. I'm really humbled and honored to be here. This is my first time on this side of the internet with you all, so thanks so much for joining. Um, yeah, my name's Evan. I'm an American. I'm living in Paris at the moment. I'm an artist, and so I'm going to talk a bit about the art I've been making the last few years, how it's changed as the internet's changed, um, and hopefully weave some threads through here. Um, the, the work I'm making is primarily shows up in these three areas of the gallery, public space and the internet. The mediums I'm using are often quite different, but historically the work I've been making has been connected by this relationship between misuse and empowerment, and how misuse can kind of be this lens that we, as we all know, look at technologies, but lots of things in life around us to sort of see things that have other sort of unintended uses, right? To make things like consumer domestic products um, much more interesting, right? So this is the Doomba, this old, old internet meme, right? But so good, right? Such a wonderful gift that the internet gave us with the Doomba. Like, I can't wait until, I, I really feel like this should be in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art. This is one of my favorite sculptures I've seen in the last few years. Um, but for me, I try to have like Doomba vision when I'm, when I'm doing um, activism or when I'm doing art and thinking about like what else can I duct tape knives onto it to make it more interesting than it was the way the manufacturer sort of uh, advertised it to me, right? Um, and so that's kind of a main inspiration for a lot of the artwork that I, that I look at, that I'm a fan of, and that I'm trying to make in my own practice. Um, and so, so two maybe more specific themes I'm gonna try to show through different projects are one, this idea of technological empowerment, which is part of the reason I became an artist, um, and the other, this idea of visualization through misuse. Um, and my, my kind of, my history with te technological empowerment went back to the, when I was an architect and I was at university and I, was, I had one class about computers that my dad sort of forced me to take and I didn't think was that interesting. This was back when I was literally still doing like graphite with a straight edge on vellum, right? This is like the first class where they were introducing 3D modeling and AutoCAD. And there was one week about the internet and I have this like really vivid memory where the professor brought up this fetch window on an old Mac and like edited a text document and dragged it in and the dog ran it up to the internet and then hit refresh on the browser and it updated. And of course this is like small news now, but for me this was huge, like I couldn't believe it. Like I really just couldn't believe that for free I could say anything to anybody and nobody could really censor it. It just seemed like it was too good to be true and that was kind of the death nail on my architectural career. Like I would go on to graduate and work for a couple of years but very quickly was falling in love with the internet in the early kind of like flash days, remember that time, it was really fun. Um, and so I was coming home from my architecture job and sort of trying to learn code and trying and kind of had my first introduction to open source like reading Joshua Davis's uh, PlayStation FLA files anybody remembers that day. Um, but that was kind of my introduction to technology and it was really empowering. Like it was a feeling that I still remember and try to like hone in on when I'm getting more depressed these days. Um, and so how that showed up in some of my work, um, I'm gonna start around like 2005 with some projects that I've been doing up to uh, projects I've been doing right now. Um, back in 2005, 2006, I co-founded an organization called Graffiti Research Lab uh, with a friend named James Powderly while we were in residency at IBEAM in New York. Um, and the, the basic idea had, we had with Graffiti Research Lab was that technologies were getting a lot cheaper um, to the point where they were almost getting disposable, like LEDs, digital projectors were getting really cheap, lasers were getting really cheap. Um, and we were interested in trying to make projects that would start to get graffiti writers and activists talking to the free software movement more, like have a sort of common dialogue for these two very different groups of tool builders. And so with that as like a premise, we sort of thought of ourselves as the Q branch for graffiti writers, right? I'll just show one quick project. This was called Laser Tag. This was a, in retrospect, very simple computer vision project, but um, 
we would basically go out with a digital projector and, and we would invite activists and we would invite graffiti writers and we would set up on the sort of biggest buildings that we could find in town. Um, and we would just have this kind of open system. Like the only rule set we had with the project was there couldn't be a sensor button. People had to be allowed to say whatever they wanted. Most of the times we did it without permission, which isn't saying much because at the time um, there wasn't a lot of people projecting in public, so there weren't a lot of sort of laws in this sort of gray area. Um, so even when the police usually came, it was more of a conversation than a ticket. Um, and so we were making, this is one example of lots of projects we were making where it was kind of about um, amplifying free speech, like trying to use technologies that were getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to level that playing field between people who live in cities and people who advertise in cities and what kind of visual language and visual communication we have in both those places. Um, so, so that was the work Graffiti Research Lab was doing. Um, at some point we realized with Graffiti Research Lab that the sort of technical hacking we were doing uh, was much less interesting than the more social hacking we were doing. And we also, we were getting much more press than we deserved and we were trying to figure out why that was happening. And w one thing we sort of came to was we were sort of fulfilling this narrative that the media wants, which is that we are living in the future now, right? Which is why everyone's reporting on hoverboards now. Like, we can't, we're here, you know? And graffiti writers with lasers was one of those apparently like monumental future points that we had hit. And so, the, the media was saying to write about our projects, and so we realized that this was sort of a social hack where we could start to empower other people with maybe more marginalized voices to get in the newspapers more often. And so our mission changed slightly, and so we kind of morphed the energy that we had with Graffiti Research Lab into this group called the Free Art and Technology Lab, which didn't really have a sort of set code or, or manifesto, but the basic idea was that we were going to use um, what even Franco called radical entertainment, or this idea that you can make sort of engaging media on the internet that people are going to want to click on, not because they agree with the politics, because they want to see people acting a fool in the streets, right? Um, so I'll show, I'll show one project here. This was, this was from a suite of projects we did in Berlin, gosh, a few years ago now, called Fuck Google, where we came together to make Fuck Google projects. So this was one where we um, rented a, actually Aaron Barthel, who's over here, you can see him seated there in the driver's seat, rented this car for very cheap, bought a roof rack off of eBay, I think, for like 15 euros. And then everything above the roof was just cardboard and duct tape and wires. So there was nothing technical in this project. It was purely a social hack. And this was probably my second greatest technologically empowering moment. Driving the Google car is fucking amazing. So here's what that looks like. So once we had the car, we were just brainstorming, like, what are the little skits we could play out that would kind of put Google in a compromised position? And so, yeah, I was breaking down. This is the, this is drinking and, drinking and driving. <laughs> And if you want to know how strong Google's brand is, this is a, a staged carjacking where someone off the streets risks their life to save a corporate automobile engaged in spying practices. So the idea is that we were then leaking these on the internet, and this was this was a long time ago, back when we were like not sure if Google was evil or not, right? So this discussion was happening. It's happening more in Germany than other places, actually. But the idea was to try to get those conversations happening outside of places like this and outside of places like art galleries and art institutions, um, and more into like the mainstream press and like people over coffee picking up this story and, and started to talk about these issues. That was kind of the idea behind Fat Lab Function. Um, I was also maintaining a solo practice at the same time as I was doing these more collaborative projects. Um, this, is a, this is one called Free Speech I did in Vienna in 2000 and I don't know, like three, four years ago now. Um, another, this is again like a very simple technology. This is another rented car uh, with vinyl letters of a mobile phone number, mobile Viennese phone number, and an arrow pointing to a loudspeaker on the roof. And that's, that's the only input you get as the viewer. And we just drove this around Vienna for three days. And people that were sort of curious, curious enough to call, they would have their 
their phone would get routed directly to the speaker. And there was no one on the other line, so their first realization that they were sort of in the system was when they would just hear themselves like, hello, <laughs> echoing throughout the streets. So I'll show a bit of what that looks like. And so, so like that guy was maybe my favorite, or maybe the guy who just picked up and just started laughing, right? Because even though when confronted with this sort of louder voice in public than they were maybe thought they were going to have when they set out to commute to work or go get a coffee, um, even though maybe they didn't choose to say these more poignant points, you know, maybe just the laughter to me was like this more pure feeling of what technological empowerment feels like, right? Like, just laughing on the streets because you kind of have this empowered voice. Like that's, that's the feeling I want to get as an artist. And so some of the work I was doing was trying to sort of set up these, set up these systems that would allow other people to have those sort of experiences. Um, so again, like very simple tools for empowerment, very low tech tools for empowerment. Um, the, the other thread that I was doing throughout that period and maybe more so in the last three years has to do with sort of this idea of visualizing the invisible, which I think is something that artists wrestle with quite a bit, um, and specifically thinking about visualizing the network, thinking about visualizing the internet and how the internet is sort of touching us and uh, we have this new connection culturally to each other. Um, and so I did, this was maybe three or four years ago now, I did this sort of homage to Wikipedia. Um, I still love surfing Wikipedia. For me, as someone who's sort of maybe has a bit of nostalgia for the old days of the internet. I feel like Wikipedia is one of these few holdouts on the internet where there's semi-egoless uploads still happening, you know? Um, it's not necessarily, people are making uploads not because they're trying to craft their own avatar online, but they, because they really want to explain how a Doro knot functions, right? Or they really want to explain how a boxer engine works, right? It's, 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 it's content that if, if Constant were here, he would call uh, media with an alibi, right? It's media that has a reason for existing beyond just sort of supporting our own online visions of who we are and who we aren't. And so for this reason, I really love Wikipedia. It feels like this really sort of free, honest place to surf sometimes. Um, and so I made this series of 11 websites kind of as a, as a monument to Wikipedia where I spent, I spent a summer just surfing for animated GIFs on Wikipedia, which was a really awesome way to spend a summer. And then when I found ones that I would want to kind of use as raw materials, I would just copy and paste them a couple hundred times and, and rename the file so that when the browser tries to load it in, it doesn't, doesn't cache them all immediately. It thinks they're all separate files. Um, and so what ends up happening is, um, and of course, it can't load them all in at once, right? So it just starts loading them in as the packets are sort of being delivered in this linear fashion. And so the pieces never quite look the same. They're all, in a sense, these kind of unique views where depending on your processor speed and what browser you're using and how fast your internet connection is, they're always going to load in slightly different as the packets sort of traverse the network in this linear fashion. Um, and so what you get is, are these compositions that are very simple, but they're not, in this case, like a perfect circle, right? You kind of see this visualization of the data kind of as it's going through the network. And so if you view these same pieces in the Tor browser, which I don't have to explain what it is in this audience, which is really fun for the first time, um, <laughs> you can get a sense of how, so this is the exact same website just viewed through Tor, and so you can see in the piece how the, how the composition is altered, right? Because as the pieces are moving around, it's being rerouted to different nodes, they kind of come back together in a way that's very different than the way it's happening as a straight connection through Firefox. And so the resulting composition is less fluid, it's more staggered, and you can kind of, there's some side of visual clue of how that piece went through the network. Um, another series I've been doing for several years now is, I've been archiving my own browsing folder, my cache directory. I've been basically archiving that every couple of weeks. 
Um, and then when I get invited to show a piece from that series, I just basically, I, I use uh, image packing algorithms to just pack all those images into the smallest amount of room possible. And I'll make these prints that are just straight printouts of my internet cache. So this is what one month of my internet cache looks like. Um, this is what three months looks like. They're relatively uncensored. I go through it to look and make sure, because sometimes my wife will use the computer and make sure there's nothing of her she doesn't want on there. And I, and I check it for banking details. But besides that, it's pretty, pretty much uncensored. Um, and so it's meant to be, I, I think of them kind of as self-portraits. I think of them actually more like false self-portraits, because it's unless you truly think that you are your browsing data, um, it's not, it does, it's, these prints aren't who I feel like I am. Um, but in, I think in the, over the long term, the idea is more that they're meant to be this sort of portrait of the internet at this one moment of time, right? And as, as sort of our screen sizes change and screens shift from our laps to our pockets and as browser resolutions and all, the, all these standards change and, and our kind of fabric of the web changes, these prints hopefully when someone digs out of my basement like 20 years from now, they'll have these sort of prints of what the internet felt like in this one moment of time. That's the idea anyway. Um, Another related series has to do, again, with this kind of shift from, from the screen to the pocket. Like, I'm really sort of fascinated with this idea of casual computing, which I feel, I feel like that move when we started having computers in our pockets every day was a really fundamental shift. Um, and so I have this series called Multi-Touch Paintings that are created just from, I basically just take a piece of tracing paper and put it over my phone and then perform the sort of interface tasks that it asked me to do. So this one's called Slide to Unlock. Um, this is a. This one's called Zoom In, Zoom Out, and they're they're literally just ink on ink on paper. So the capacitive touch still works through the paper, um, and it's and kind of like a, maybe a short term. It's it's meant to be maybe purely a visualization in a sense, um, but I think maybe. I hope that there's more, there's also the kind of an artistic side of these too, where they're also kind of commenting on the way we're consuming media right now. So this one's called Next, 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 right? So this is, and, and Next, Next, Next is the way probably this piece will be consumed 99% of the time, right? The, for the 10 people that see this hanging on a wall, the rest are just gonna next through this on Instagram, right? And so it's meant to sort of kind of archive like the, the bug in amber a little bit, these, these moments that we're going through right now where we're touching pixels for the first time and these things that kind of feel sort of high tech in a sense, um, but quickly are feeling very blunt. Like to me, this feels like a very blunt way to consume media, a very blunt way to have a relationship with art. Um, so hopefully it's commenting on that a bit too. Um, this is a related piece from the series. This, is, this piece is called Level Cleared. Um, this is me playing Angry Birds from start to finish. Um, <laughs> and so... <laughs> So the, the grid starts in the upper left corner with level 1-1. Whoever else has a angry or had at one point an Angry Birds addiction, you know the level well. And then I just play straight through. It takes me full-time Angry Birds play, like eight to 10 hours a day for three days to get through. And they keep adding levels. So when I have to remake the piece now, it's even more of a nightmare. Um, and it just marches straight through. I have one sheet per level, per attempt at a level. Um, and, and so again, this piece, like I've been thinking a lot about how, the art, how art and the internet relate in terms of the consumption of art and how time is affected with our consumption of art. And I was actually, Aram, I was thinking about conversations we had early on in the fat days where we were both kind of joking at one point about how we felt like the internet was sort of, we always had to load projects up. Like if we didn't release something in two weeks, it was like we were dead on the internet, right? And it felt this kind of like push from the internet that I had to keep making and keep making and keep making. And there was something interesting about participating in that culture, but then more and more I've been thinking about how can you maybe still contribute and participate in that kind of consumption of media, but then have the same piece mean something slightly different for people that are gonna invest more amounts of time in it, right? And how pieces, even if people consume it in a blog post title and have one reaction, which might be a familiar reaction like laughter, which I actually really like from this piece, um, I'm trying to embed in these other kind of readings of the work where if you come in and you sit on this bench, right? And, and th this is maybe my interpretation of the piece, right? Um, and you sit in front of these like 1500 sheets of paper and after the kind of wave of laughter leaves you and you realize like all the things we could have done in that time, right? Like I could have learned French, I could have lost 10 pounds, I could have learned how to cook more, you know? Could have read a whole bunch of books. Um, and instead I was like just flicking like birds at pigs over and over and over and over again. And so it's, 
I, I like both readings. Like I like the reading that the that it can be consumed in Instagram quickly. I like the reading. Um, I, I if people are able to sit with it and maybe. Um, contemplate these larger issues, I like it as well, but I think in art making right now, there's this, I'm trying to make work that isn't just addressing the internet's drive to have things faster and quicker and in blog post titles, right? Because I felt it sort of affecting the art I was making. Um, and also the internet has like fundamentally changed, right? Like I think, um, I think the times that, that we were at, at IBM and, and we were doing Fat Lab and the times that we were sort of wrestling with that work, things really changed, like we all felt it. In this crowd, I don't even have to really talk about it, right? But for a while, the internet to me felt like this, and shame on me, you know? Um, but as I've been making work, and the work's been changing, and my relationship to the internet's been changing, um, and so I'm gonna go into some things that I know you all know, but this is kind of like my personal take on it, right? My, this is like how I came to think about the situation that we're in now. I used to think the internet was the Big Bang, right? That was how I was introduced to it, like I thought, holy shit, this is gonna happen and, and it's just gonna keep multiplying, getting bigger and bigger and there'll be a server for every interest and everybody will be a publisher, everyone's gonna be empowered. Um, and I thought it was this big bang model of what was gonna happen. And I, I think more and more that like, it's actually the big crunch model, which is when the universe expands to a maximization point and then at some point starts contracting down, right? And I think, I think that that middle point, I think that middle point was when we accepted Gmail. <laughs> you, you know, like I think once we like, culturally decided that someone could read our emails and advertise us to our inbox, I really think people at Google were just like, holy shit, like, they bought it? Like, from that point on, it was just really over. And so now it's been, of course, condensing and condensing into fewer and fewer servers. And anyway, we all know this stuff, right? And so, so, so this kind of like, this, this condensation of the internet down to one point feels like it's happening. Um, the, the kind of targeted marketing that just was annoying at one point now feels, really more sinister, like, the, I mean, it was kind of okay to read our email and advertise to us, but then when you start, like, kind of snitching on us, that that was just, that was hard for me. Like, I, we don't even need to talk about this because I know it gets, gets addressed all the time here. But for me, as someone who is making art that was engaged in the internet and a lot of the inspirations I was taking for from the kind of free culture movement and the free, free software movement and engaged with the internet and, like, the, the convolution of these three things of like monetization of the web, the centralization of the web, and then this kind of spying scandal, they really left me kind of like staggering for ways to get back to making art about an internet that didn't feel funny to me anymore, right? Like the internet was, this, this is how I felt. Like I felt like the lolcats were just this Trojan horse, you know? And, and I, after all this was sort of happening, I, I couldn't even see the cats on the internet anymore. Like I thought the internet was the land of the cats and the unicorns and now, the fur has kind of been removed and you just see the Terminator shiny skull and the red beady eye. Um, and so if, and just from like a personal standpoint, it got hard to get interested in making art in that medium again. And so that was like all leading up to this talk, which maybe a lot of you have seen either at Transmedia Alley last year or here, or I mean, or on the internet. Um, I thought I was in the internet for a second there. This was Peter's talk at Transmediali where um, he, he gets on stage and he basically says we've lost and it's over, right? Which is something I know that um, we've heard here from, uh, we've heard here from Frank and Rob uh, 10 years ago, right? I know this isn't a new narrative, but for me, Peter's talk came along kind of at the right time where um, th like the Pirate Bay for me and the work that Pirate Biren had been doing was really one of my main like heroes, one of the main reasons I started making art. Like the, the Pirate Bay for me is still, I think, one of the most amazing things made during my lifetime and it was what really turned me kind of from architecture into thinking about how entertainment and activism could overlap and how people could really change things and have a kind of um, power structure altering things that we could contribute to culture. And when you have these kind of personal heroes get on stage and tell you that that's over, when I was happy to hear that, I had this kind of moment where I was like, why am I feeling happy about hearing that, you know? And I realized that that was kind of how I was feeling and to have somebody else say that, um, it felt really, good's the wrong word, but it felt strangely empowering to sort of start to admit to myself that maybe the kind of ship was sinking, right? And so shortly after that, we were also having conversations within the Fat Lab internally and not by unanimous decision, but by majority, we decided that we were gonna shut the doors at Fat Lab. Um, and I, I won't speak for the group, but my, my personal thoughts on why we, they shut down, which maybe isn't important in the greater sense, but just um, kind of again, like as a kind of a, my personal take on how I'm working through this stuff was like, 
I felt like Fat Lab, like the internet had sort of outpaced us. Like that idea of radical entertainment had a, had a moment when there was a loophole in the media where kind of um, companies and capitalism hadn't really figured out viral marketing yet. And we had this, this like big opening where we could really speak to people on a larger platform because there weren't whole divisions at Wyden and Kennedy that were just trying to do this for the largest companies. Like it was, we figured that out first. And so we had this kind of weakness that we could exploit. But as that changed, we kind of failed as a group, I think, to keep up with new modes of activism. And the other thing that I, I was sort of feeling was that we were kind of providing this um, David and Goliath narrative to people, both within the group that were getting closer to sort of Silicon Valley and our audience, which I felt like was kind of getting closer and closer to Silicon Valley, that like people that were getting entrenched more into that way of thinking were looking and enjoying our content in a way that sort of felt um, uncomfortable in a way, and it felt like the kind of humorous pranks that we were pulling was helping them cope in a way with um, the fact that they were supporting that system. And it kind of felt like we were the comedian, the Titanic, like telling jokes as it was sinking, or it felt to me that way. And so at some point it felt more powerful to kind of just say goodbye and maybe put a message in a bottle and then jump off the ship rather than sit there and keep bailing out this ship, right? Um, and so that's where I was at the beginning of this year. Um, and so the work that I'm gonna show from this point on, which I think I still have, yeah, okay, 25 minutes or so, is, is kind of the work I've been doing to try to get back to that point that I had when I first saw Fetch and FTP and kind of understood in a very rudimentary way how the internet functioned and what that empowering moment felt like and trying to struggle to get back to a point where I could make art sort of that was engaged in the internet again. And so, one way, one way I started that search was to sort of start from the beginning and thinking about like what is our cultural conception of what the internet is, what it looks like. And we have a, generally a kind of very poor visual metaphor for what the internet is, right? So this is just a Google image search for the word internet, which doesn't to me feel very representative of what the network is or what it feels like. Um, and so I started to get more into thinking about what it was, like it can't just be you know, blue glowing logos um, and clouds. It has to be something physical. And so I started reading Andrew Bloom's books, Tubes. I started um, reading Neil Stephenson's Mother Earth Motherboard, which if there's any sort of internet infrastructure nerds is like an amazing primer, kind of the first maybe seminal text about following internet cables around the globe. But just kind of understanding what it looks like, what it looks like in these moments of transition when it sort of enters the water and reaches the land. Um, and, and one thing that Andrew Bloom talks about in his book is this idea of these kind of like, there's, there's no monuments for this thing that's really a major part of our sort of time here on earth and maybe our part of culture. It seems like there's not these places that we can kind of go visit and commune with it in the same way there are other architectural landmarks. Um, and so you get these kind of like lonely manhole covers on these very desolate beaches in Nova Scotia. Um, and so at the same time that I was, I was sort of doing that research, um, and this is going to sound like a big left turn, but I'm going to, I'm going to pull it back. Um, at the same time I was doing that research, I was also working on another project that required the use of an infrared camera. And so I was kind of spending my time doing this research and looking around the internet trying to find really cheap um, infrared cameras, because of course I'm an artist and I'm broke. And I kept finding myself on these, these websites of people selling technology to ghost hunters, which is a community I had no ex inter interactions with, no experience of, but they just had really good cheap infrared cameras. Um, <laughs> And, and I was like, I was sitting there in these online ghost hunting shops and they were amazing. Like I felt myself having one of those moments with technology where, um, that I hadn't felt in a long time was just like, like a kid, like looking at this technology and being like, what the fuck is this? Like, why? I don't understand. And they, um, but then I started to get interested in it more on kind of like a metaphorical or conceptual level because what the ghost hunter, ghost hunting community was, is kind of interested in doing is they're, they talk about disembodied human energy a lot. And so they're making tech to try to visualize disembodied human energy. And in a sense, this felt like what I was trying to do with a lot of the work that I was doing, which was trying to take all this kind of invisible momentum that's getting stored in servers and going through the fiber optic cables and thinking about ways to kind of visualize that work to come to some understanding of it. And the ghost hunting community had this amazing tech to do that with. And so then I started going really deep down this ghost hunting rabbit hole, which was another fun way to spend three months on the internet. Um, I'll show just one clip. Um, because I'd never seen any of this. So people that are familiar with these communities, this is maybe old hat. But to me, this was like just fascinating. So this is 
they, they also come from where I come from. So this is like the Midwest Spirit Organization. Like they're all from the Midwest in the US, right? Because it's super boring there. And so apparently like <laughs> you, you either do drugs or you hunt for ghosts. And so this is one from the Midwest Spirit Group, but this is one of many, many clips on, on YouTube. So this, this is a video shot in full spectrum camera, which is just a camera that's been modified so that you see a little bit more of the ultraviolet spectrum and a little bit more of the infrared spectrum. And the audio you're gonna hear is from what, what they call a spirit box, which is essentially a hacked radio that just keeps scanning. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, this is a device that you guys can come forward, any spirits, and speak with me. Uh, so, if you have a message, please come forward and speak to me into this device. Hi. Hi, tell me your name. Okay, I'll let you do your own YouTube searching for that. But even that idea of like, if you have a message for me, come speak into this device. Like I want to use that for like the title of my next solo show. To me it's like so, th there, there's like something happening there that seems like a statement that's greater than the ghost hunting community. And also their relationship with technology kind of feels very, I mean it's strange to say this because for me as a sort of non-believer in um, ghosts, um, I find the technology maybe inherently flawed, but I, the approach seems so honest to me in a way. Like they're, they're really setting out to make tools in a very honest way, very little commercial interest to try to satisfy this niche community. Um, so anyway, this is like a, it was really getting back to this sort of like DIY culture of people making technology for their own needs. Um, and and it's, a, it's a relatively self-aware community too. Like they talk about this idea of matrixing a lot, which is the same as apophenia, right? It's this idea that our brains are kind of hardwired to find patterns in randomness. Like they're aware of this. And so skepticism is like a big badge that people, if you want to rise the ranks in the, in the um, paranormal community, you have to kind of debunk more ghosts than you find, right? Um, and this to me is something that's really interesting too because I think that they might actually be more critical of the investigations they're doing than we're doing, right? And so that when we look and we see that we've got 5,807 5, friend requests, it feels like this might be a matrixing that we're doing with our own technology, with social media rather than the ghost hunting. Or whether, like, the, 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 the kind of like popular idea that like technology can solve all problems, that we can explain all these complicated problems in 13 minutes or less and 120 characters or less, it seems like maybe our relationship with technology maybe isn't any more flawed than their relationship with technology. Um, and so I decided to sort of set out on my own kind of pilgrimage to the internet, right? In the same way that ghost hunters, they, this isn't something that ghost hunters do kind of around the kitchen table over coffee, right? They go to what they call areas of activity, which are actually not graveyards, right? This would be an area of inactivity. It's more like abandoned hospitals or insane asylums, like areas where activity happened. Um, and so the, because I wasn't looking for ghosts, I'm looking for more of this like reforged relationship with a, an innocence lost of the internet. Um, the area that I decided to go to, which is talked about a lot by Stephenson's Mother Earth Motherboard article, is this uh, Porth Kernow Beach, which is, if you're in the UK and you just keep driving west as far as you can until it, it, literally when the land ends, there's a hotel called Land's End. And when you're there, you're within like, three kilometers of really cool stuff. So you're in, you're where 15% of the global internet flows through fiber optic cables. Um, it's historically where the pirate ships would hide in the coves. Um, 2000 BC, it was where all the standing stone circles, there's all these standing stones in this area. Um, it's where uh, in 1870, the first telegraph came out of the ocean, the exact same beach the fiber optic cables are at now. Um, Two kilometers up the beach is where Marconi was building these amazing structures to send the first wireless transmissions over the Atlantic, all within this super remote um, area way out at the west of the UK. And so I made my map and I had my little destinations I wanna go to. I um, rented a car, I got my gear. I had a mix of like ghost hunting gear that I'd bought and some that I'd made and some just other devices I thought might come in handy. Um, and I started by doing something that Neil Stephenson suggests you do if you're hunting for the internet, which is to follow the manholes. Um, and so I started just following the manholes. And it really, it, it's, so when you're on these like surfer beaches where nobody is, and you see like 30 manholes in the parking lot that's meant just to get to the beach to go surfing, you're probably getting close. Um, 
on these little farm roads that were just out in the middle of nowhere with just sheep kind of grazing. Every once in a while there'd be uh, a driveway that had these really large sort of access covers. Um, and when you look, they're designed to look like these typical British country houses, but on closer inspection, you can see that there's all these extra security measures and blackout windows. And so this is a uh, internet landing location. Um, farms that have way more air conditioning than they need for the <laughs> sheep. That's probably a good sign that you're getting close. But I wasn't, I wasn't really interested in it as like a, as a sort of a journalistic endeavor. Like it was really more, I wanted to sort of step away from the computer for a moment. I wanted to get out into nature. Um, and I wanted to sort of just see what it felt like to stand on top of that cable. You know, what did it feel like to stand on top of this cable where 25% of the traffic was flowing through? Um, and so I started taking this series of like landscapes, like just landscape photography. Um, sometimes, sometimes the cable is within the frame. Um, when, I, when I took this photo, I actually didn't know exactly what I was shooting, but in this frame is both the cable and the um, GCHQ tapped cable, which you can kind of see the dishes up there in the background. Um, but it's, it's, it was less for me about like those actual recording the cables, the dishes, and it was more about Something that I read about in, in Andrew Bloom's book was that there's this really interesting phenomenon that happens when you go hunting for the internet, which is like you end up in these super remote locations. Like you're trying to go have this research and experience with telecommunications, but you end up like on these really lonely beaches, which is by design because they don't want cables and nets around them. Um, many times you don't have 3G or cell phone service, and it's kind of just you and like, you know, this lonely beach. And it's this sort of interesting, um, for me it was really beautiful. Like it really felt, uh, it felt good. It felt, so this is something I've been doing more and more lately. And I just, I go to these places as a way not to necessarily document physical artifacts of the internet, but more just putting myself in sort of a place where I want to make art about the internet. Um, and, and the internet manifests itself in different ways in different countries. In the UK, it's just these wooden signs. This is, it's just a yellow wooden sign that says telephone cable on it, which is like, the most beautiful kind of like anticlimactic, understated monument you could have, right? So this is one of the biggest global internet connection points in the world, and it's just this little tiny sign, you know? And to me, that was really perfect in a way. Like I was, I was really, it felt good that it was that and not something else. Um, and so at the same time I was taking that photography, I was also taking readings with this series of ghost hunting devices. This is probably my favorite one. This is called the Ovulus 3. Um, this is by a company called Digital Dowsing, which is a really great name for a, for a ghost hunting tech company um, made by um, Bill Chappell. Um, and so the Ovulus 3 has this kind of like old, it's called visual draw mode. Um, and based on kind of EMF and temperature readings, it has this drawing system that it spits out. And so at every place I was taking a photograph, I was also taking this reading with this ghost hunting device. Um, and so this manifested in different ways when I show it in the gallery. One way was in this series of essentially paired landscape photography where on the top is just the, the photograph from these various places and then on the bottom sort of laser etched into the surface of the print are these readouts from this ghost hunting device um, which is kind of even if you didn't know that came to the piece and didn't know the background there's meant to be this kind of play between analog and digital and this play between kind of the spiritual and the real um, and when you view these prints you kind of have the same interaction with the print that I was having when I was documenting them, which was you, you have this kind of natural position when you're kind of viewing the horizon line, and then when we kind of check our phones, right? And it's kind of like this all day long. And so the pieces are meant to have that as well, where you, you kind of look at the horizon line in the photo, and then you kind of bend down to look at the little digital readout. Um, so this was, this was one of the series from, from um, an exhibition I did in London last year. Um, six months ago, no, three months ago, um, I got an invitation to come to New Zealand, which was a place that was on my kind of like um, bucket list for internet exploratory research purposes because New Zealand has this, this, they have more than two cables, but there's one cable called the Southern Cross Network, which is essentially its main connection to the globe. And it comes in on the West Coast and then crosses like, I don't even know, like 30, kilometers maybe, and then exits on the right. So it comes over from Australia, goes underground for a very short amount of time, and then bounces off essentially to California. Um, and that's its main connection to the world, these two very actually unguarded um, connection points. I, 
maybe in the Q&A I can talk about more about that. But basically, on this trip, I got, I mean, I got there, and they were doing construction work, and the cable was just really there. Like, it was dug up and in a puddle and just sitting there next to this military compound with, like, um, this military airstrip with, like, planes taking off. Um, and I was there for two hours with ghost hunting device, just kind of touching the cable. Nobody said anything. It was amazing. Um, and prior to this trip, though, I was doing more kind of research and trying to understand what the internet really, really was. Um, and I, there's a lot of people in the room who are more who have more technical knowledge than I do. So if I'm if I'm um, misquoting things, please tell me afterwards so I can update this. But my my current understanding is that what's going through the fiber optic is essentially. Um, Infrared, um, infrared laser light that's being modulated at different frequencies that kind of center around this 1,550 nanometer mark, right? Um, and so give or take a few nanometers, the internet happens generally in this near infrared spectrum, um, which is interesting to me as kind of um, an art maker because most of our digital devices can sense in that near infrared spectrum in that same 1,550 nanometer range. Um, so most most digital cameras you can open up, and if you go all the way down to the CCD, you can take off the infrared blocking chip, and you get left with a camera that senses that light, and you can put another lens on top that blocks everything but the infrared light, and then you're left with a device that's kind of, in my head anyway, sensing the world in the same sort of spectrum that's going through the fiber optic cable. Um, so these tutorials are, uh, I have this, this presentation I'm going to have a link to at the end, so the links are here, but this is from a website called LifePixel, which has really amazing to, like screw-by-screw -screw tutorials for how to do this with most consumer and like prosumer digital cameras. Um, and so then I started shooting these, th these, are these are photographs from, this is from the west coast of New Zealand, um, shot with this modified Lumix GF1 camera. Um, and so it started to like have this feeling where the visuals that these cameras were giving, like in, in, there's like a technical connection to the internet, but for me there was also sort of a visual connection where the photos had this sort of feeling that I was having. They were sort of these dark, strange glimpses of the internet. It wasn't nyan cats and unicorns, right? It was this kind of like darker, stranger view of what the internet landscape looked like. And the more I was taking photos, the sort of the less and less interested I got in actually shooting a cable, and the more and more interested I got in just what these landscapes looked like. Um, and so in this example, you can kind of see the dirt that's kind of slowly growing over from where the trench was dug. Um, or in this one, in, from this distance, you can't see anything. There's a small moment where like an old coaxial cable kind of comes out of that cliff. But for me, it's more about really thinking about like an old school art form of like the landscape and trying to think about how I can make these landscape images that are sort of reflective both of the physical landscape and of our kind of like network landscape and cultural landscape. So these are just some of the kind of images I was taking on this New Zealand trip. Um, and yeah, again, sometimes there's like no visual evidence. Sometimes it's just, just a tree that happens to be growing on top of the internet. Um, and so I'm still, this is stuff I'm still going through at the moment. Um, so now I'm kind of drifting into works in progress. Um, but where I'm, where I'm thinking this is going, um, in one way, is a series of new websites that I'm going to be making that are really boring. I think there's like a really big market in boring in the arts that's coming up. Like I think we've had enough of this like really quick stuff. So now I'm going to take it back. And so I'm making pieces that are, I had these experiences. So these are tripod shots. That I'm shooting usually like 10 to 15 minute tripod shots at these different locations. Um, and so there are these like, really quiet moments. It's essentially just video um, streaming into a browser. Um, and part of the idea is like giving, forcing people to have the experience that I was having. So was, I would find myself in these like amazing locations and sometimes there'd even be like whales breaching in the background and like seven minutes into the shot I'd catch myself like, you know, bending down to the phone again. And like even in this like am amazing environment, like I was having a hard time breaking out of that really like rapid face sort of clickbait mentality that I'm starting to fall into as well. And so I want these websites to be super, super boring. Like more contemplative, more on the timeline of what viewing nature is like rather than what the viewing the web is like. Um, so this is, this is the triangular sign here is what the, what the cable signs look like in New Zealand, which there's, if there's any Copy Me fans, like when I got out there and found that there's this like beautiful triangle like standing over the internet was like an amazing moment for me. Um, but the, so these websites are gonna be different websites. Each website will just have one video flowing through it. Um, 
slow infrared video shots with this sort of audio in the background. The audio is made from um, my own ghost hunting tech, which I'll be releasing when I get finished with all this stuff. So this is my own version of the spirit box, where instead of just scanning through the radio, I have it hooked up to a pulse sensor. So it's skipping through the radio stations based on my heartbeat. So every time my pulse goes, it, it switches radio stations. Um, and so the audio is like, yeah, it looked, I looked rather strange, like just kind of sitting there trying to commune with the internet, like hooked up to this heart monitor and this infrared camera. Um, but the pieces are sort of meant to kind of hopefully give some of those feelings that I was having when I was there. And the, the other idea is that these videos are all going to be located in servers that are as close as possible to where I shot them. So I'm, I'm actually thinking of them less as websites as kind of like network specific videos. And so in the New Zealand example, uh, I, have, I have server space in New Zealand now where these videos are hosted so that when you, when you view the video, um, it loads into the browser and it's streaming you know, chances are you have like kind of like a 50-50 chance, depending on what country you're in, that the, the video, as it's being converted into the same spectrum that it's shot in, is also streaming kind of like just underneath the, the frame there. Um, and so even though you can't kind of witness this visually, the idea is like trying to, kind of like I was doing with the, with the Wiki, Wikipedia series, like trying to come up with not just a piece that's kind of a visual aesthetic of the internet, but something that's really kind of about an experience of the network. Um, and then the last sort of thing I'm playing with is that they're going to be all hosted at these URLs that when you copy and paste the URL into um, a mapping application, the, the URL is actually a GPS coordinate. So if you paste the URL into Google Maps, it'll take you to the exact location where the camera was housed. And so in Google Earth, you can kind of see the triangular sign in the tree that is the same, same um, sign and tree from, from the image. Um, and so, so I'm kind of playing with the idea of the URL as being both an address in the, on the globe and in the network and trying to tie, again, together these two things. Um, and, and part of this for me is, again, like without being too nostalgic for, for the internet of old, um, a lot of the influences that I'm drawing from, from the kind of earlier net art scene um, was, was characterized with this kind of classic net art diagram where the art happens here, right? Like it's not, there was this big push in the earlier net art wave that wasn't about having kind of imagery that was sort of quasi an aesthetic of the internet coming on Tumblr and being printed and 3D printing into objects and showing up in a gallery, but it was really thinking more fundamentally about the internet as a platform and a vehicle for, for viewing art and art that can only happen within that medium. Um, and so I'm trying to kind of take that idea that's an old one and overlay that diagram on top of something that's like one step removed in terms of the metaphor and thinking about art that happens in a physical location and in the network at the same time. Um, I could do one more project or we could do Q&A. How much time do we have now? Five more minutes? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll wrap it up there. Is that Okay, okay, I'll do one more project. Okay, so that was, that's going up to like, yeah, three, this is now, Two months ago, three months ago, I got invited to do a piece in Paraguay, which is not one of the main internet hubs globally. Um, but I decided to kind of wrestle with a different piece of the infrastructure of the internet, which is kind of the surface, right? The place that we have this more immediate contact with the network. Um, and because I, I noticed that when we, when you film devices in infrared, there has this interesting scenario where um, the visual spectrum is kind of inverted in a way where the, the, the LEDs don't really emit much infrared light at all. And so the screen to the viewer, you see everything, but to the infrared camera, it's almost completely black. Um, and similarly, the kind of infrared lights that sort of shine from the top of all of our iPhones at our faces all the time, which we can't see with the naked eye, become more and more apparent when you shoot it with the infrared. And so, I started, I built this kind of contraption that I set up in my hotel room, which looked really strange, and then invited people to come up to the hotel room and kind of put their, put their device on top of this camera rig. And then the invitation was just to waste time. Like, again, trying to get back to this idea of casual computing. Like, what do you do when you're in line at the grocery store, waiting at the doctor's office? Like, what's your bag? You know, is it Angry Birds? Is it checking Facebook? Um, and I just said, here, waste five or 10 minutes. And then I would record them with this infrared camera. And it's kind of, in a way, it's connected, it's connected to the paranormal research, but maybe it's more connected to the multi-touch series that has to do with sort of backgrounding the digital, backgrounding the interface design and foregrounding the human movement. Um, and so what you get left with is you see the way people are kind of moving over these different devices without seeing these designs that the, 
that Apple and, and Google are designing for us. So I'll play just a minute of what that looks like. boring, right? No. Um, no, but the piece is meant to be this, have this kind of, um, these things that kind of feel so natural and we get so into it and when you kind of remove what's actually happening, it kind of ends up looking and sounding so alien, right? The audio is actually just from a contact mic that's placed on the back, so it's not, um, it's just an analog microphone picking up the kind of soft finger taps on the screen. And so the, it became just this series of people that sort of agreed to meet with me and, and give me five or ten minutes of their computing time shown in the gallery as this kind of series of, again, kind of like portraits through technology. It's called Dances for Mobile Phones. It's meant to be idea that we're kind of dancing for them. Anyway, so I'll leave it there. So this is me kind of struggling through, um, trying again to make work and trying to kind of find these sort of optimistic paths through, through a kind of increasingly dark um, internet landscape uh, and get back to this kind of like more magical moment I first had when we first kind of understood what technological empowerment felt like. So thank you so much for spending the hour with me and if there's any q and I think we have a, a couple minutes, no? Thank you. Thank you so much for your phenomenal talk, Evan. I think you can tell by the applause that the people really, really <laughs> liked it. Thank you. Um, it was really awesome. So we have another five to ten minutes for questions and answers. If you have questions, please move to the microphones. We have four microphones here in the hall. Do we have a question from the internet? Yeah. Internet? No? Hello. All right. So we start with this question from over there. Um, I really liked your term, uh, disembodied human, human energy. <coughs> We're going to start using that DHE. It's not my term, but uh, okay. I like it too. Uh, I've been writing about that as well from the dark side of, of how the internet and, and digital culture is affecting our behaviors and our society and was kind of putting that in the terms of, of disembodying experience, uh, disembodied, disembodied information. And um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm really going off of that a lot in terms of analyzing digital culture and just wondering what you think we might do in order to re-embody our culture more and not get so lost in these technological things that we can do, but to like, you know, I just was covering the, the failed Paris Climate Summit, and I feel like the, the corporate agenda is, is liking that we are going more and more into a, a disembodied place because it can capture our energy more. So it, it, I'd just like to ask you if you have any ideas what we can do to be more, more re-embodying our experiences. Yeah, no, good, um, good question. I, I mean, I can only talk about what I'm, how I'm kind of wrestling with it. In, in one sort of decision I made as, a, as an artist kind of is like I feel like I make better work when I'm optimistic rather than pessimistic. Like I think anyone who suffered through depression, like you know, or had have, have people around you with depression, it's not a good place to be in when you want to make things, produce things, right? And so part of it is like just finding ways to fall in love with it again. And so for me, that was part of it, was just trying to find ways to kind of like fall in love with things again to the point where I really wanted to make them. And the, the other one for me too, I mean, I know there's whole movements of people doing these kind of digital retreat things, which is something I hadn't participated in in a formal setting. But for me, just getting away for a moment and having these excuses, even for just a few days or a week, to sort of exist by myself without connection. I, I know it's nothing new. I know that people have been talking about this, but it had a real effect on me. I mean, one thing that I noticed was I was much more present, like, especially in the UK trip where these, these were like really cliffy regions, you know? So a lot of the hiking trails I was shooting on were 
like really steep drop off on the other side of this path. And so I couldn't even do what I normally do, even when I'm away from email, but I'm walking around the city and I'm still thinking about, oh, I gotta email this person, I gotta do that. I'm not really present, right? And I noticed that I had to like stop doing that because I kept slipping and falling and like I didn't wanna die. And so I had this moment being out in nature again where not only was I away from the tech, but mentally I kind of had to step away from it too, just to be really thinking about like left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. And being able to do that for a few days, like now I'm lining up my schedule throughout the year where I'm setting up these moments where I have that time to do it. And I don't know if that's the answer or not, but for me it's been one way to deal with it. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Next question from this microphone, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I don't know if it's on. Yeah, it's on. <laughs> Just speak into it. Um, thank you very much for your talk. And actually, for me personally, I've been also struggling a lot with the, the thought about the dark sides of the internet recently. And your talk actually gave me back a lot of positive attitude about it. Okay, good. So thank you very much for that. But one question that I have, what is your 10-second definition of what is art for oh you my God. personally? <laughs> All right, here's, here's a short one I came up with, because the, the long one's hard, right? I think, I think design is creative work that's influenced directly by money, and art is creative work that's influenced indirectly by money. And that's kind of the only difference. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Next question from that microphone over there. Um, hi. Uh, so um, I wasn't familiar with your work. I'm, I'm over here, yeah. I'm not familiar with your work, um, and I really liked it. And what I like most about it is really that, that sense of excitement and wonder um, that you first had when you discovered, um, uh, what was it, uh, FCP? No, it was? Yeah, Fetch. Yeah, Fetch, right. Um, that's sort of, that's still there in, in many ways. It's different, but okay. it's still there. Um, so, you know, I, I recently discovered physics, and I've had the sort of same thing where I am like, whoa, we're able to understand things in a way that I didn't think was possible because I hated physics in school and realized that um, it was the way it was taught that was really um, boring. And so I'm thinking, okay, if I were to do something like that, it requires you to sort of take that step away from the technicality of it to see the technicality of it. Right. And how do you, with the internet, how are you able to keep that distance? And has that been a problem for you? I mean, maybe it's easier for me because I'm not all that smart technically. I mean. It's not like I was ever so close. Like most of the code, I had some formal training when I got to graduate school, but I was never, I'm not a very happy programmer. You know, it was never in my kind of native realm anyway. Like I came more from the design field. Um, so it, it didn't feel like anything I was having to turn off so much because maybe I wasn't ever all that close to it in a sense. Um, I don't know, that's maybe a bad answer, but it's, it's probably the truth. But I've been trying to get closer to physics too. Yeah. Like for me, like I'm super fascinated by the electromagnetic spectrum right now. Like the answer's in there somewhere, I feel like, you know? <clears throat> All right, thanks. Awesome, thanks. next question from here. Hey, thanks. Um, I just, I mean, the idea of um, understanding what's happening in the internet is quite important. And I think we're a bit biased here because we all have that visualization of the internet. And my question now is, your visualization is of course very very valid and, and very vivid, but all those people that, that do those movements and they scroll Facebook, how can we make this visualization, because your, yours is quite complicated actually and not as fast, how could we, how could we manage to give, give them some sort of visualization, because what, the, what they see is only the apps and they don't really get to think about it more. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it's part, for me, part of the reason that the infrastructure side is so interesting is that I think that there's something empowering about seeing what it is and knowing how it works. Like when it seems less mystical and magical, like the cloud, of course, is this terrible metaphor that we all hate. Mm -hmm. And I think once, even when I'm explaining my work to non-technical people, um, the conversations I get into are actually kind of interesting because they're interested in knowing that too because people don't really talk about it. The media doesn't talk about it. The, the companies that are trying to sell them services don't talk that way because it doesn't benefit them, right? It's like Apple, when your phone fills up, they just want you to click here to get more cloud storage space, right? They don't want you to know how to plug in a cable and get it off. Um, and so I think it's, the question that you're asking is one that I'm asking myself. Is like how do you communicate some of these ideas to people that are... Um, I mean, I'm interested in both sides. I'm interested in people that are technically adept, having interesting thoughts and ideas and conversations around this, but then how do you also communicate to people that this is a new conversation to? Um, 
I don't know the answer to that. That's what I'm trying to kind of wrestle with in a sense. But I have, I, I recently did a show in, in Florida at a university and the, the docents there, like the people that introduced people to the work were all like were senior citizens that were volunteering times at the museum. And they were one of the most engaged group of people I've ever had surrounding my work because they, they, they knew, they, it's, it's not like they'd never heard of this stuff before, but they had a relationship with technology, but they were more willing to ask questions about it. Like they weren't, they didn't, they weren't, they didn't care if it sounded stupid. And so they were asking all these really interesting questions and seeing that happen to a community of people that were maybe a further step removed from technology than I even am, that, it's not that it was successful, but it felt to me that, that they could understand it and have a relationship, relationship to it as art pieces, it meant that there was something there that was, consumable by people that weren't, aren't in this room, you know? All right, thank you. As time is almost up, Guy and Orange, you get the honor of the last question. Thanks. Um, with your browser cache thing, I did something uh, similar with my computer. I wrote a little script that runs in the background and makes a screenshot every random second. Okay. And I had hoped about um, forgetting about it, but actually yeah. the, um, uh, the counterpart happened that I tracked the screenshots folder every moment I didn't have anything to do and my behavior was extremely affected by it. Was, did you have the same feeling about your browser, browser cache um, yeah. work? Yeah, maybe later we can trade notes. I'd like to see, see your work. Um, exactly, like, like one of the main things about that piece was like, it's like living with a security camera, right? And you always know it's there. Like I've gotten better and better about forgetting, um, but I still, I still know it's there, I still think about it. And I, I tried to do portraits of other people, like friends, like who else are you gonna ask to give the, your internet cache browsing data to, right? And it's, I, I recognized it was like a really invasive question to ask people, you know? You're really asking people, I mean, usually the cache people would give me when I was making portraits of other people, I would tell them and then they would surf and give it to me. Like to just tell them to give me the cash that you didn't know I was gonna, that you didn't know I was monitoring. This is like a really invasive question to ask. But yeah, it's essentially like learning to live with a security camera. But that's meant to be kind of built into the piece too, because maybe again, getting back to the last question, like one of the reactions I get from when people see that work in the gallery is like, they, they're like, oh wow, that's a really, um, maybe giving's the wrong word, but that's a lot of, that's a lot of, it's a, you're sharing a lot, right? Is the common reaction I get from people. Um, and, but part of the idea is then we're all kind of sharing this in different ways, right? This print, just because I'm putting in the gallery doesn't mean there's any more or less eyeballs on that set of data than your data or your friend's data. Um, but yeah, of course, when you know the camera's there, it definitely affects behavior. <laughs>